I am the co-founder of a web design company called Orbit Media. We have an Orbit alum here, Kelly Fogg is here. It's so great to see you. Uh, and that started in, I started building websites with my partner, Barrett Lombardo, who's my friend from high school and my roommate from college. Uh, and that was in January of 2000. Started Orbit in April of 2001, and I've been doing this ever since. So I'm the guy that never pivoted or did anything else. I'm just still doing this. Uh, and so it's about 18 years of doing SEO and analytics going back to the days before Google finished winning the battle for SEO. I did SEO for websites that you guys probably have long forgotten about, including AltaVista and Excite and Hotbot and Lycos. No one even knows that. I'm Gen X, you can kind of tell. OK. Uh, and I did analytics when it was spelled with a small a, not a capital A. Analytics with a capital A is a Google product. Analytics spelled with a small a is a category of all kinds of different products. And back in the day, I used Urchin, which is what Google acquired and later turned into Google Analytics. The last 10 years, I've been doing content marketing. So partly speaking, because this is content, uh, but also social media, blogging, uh, content strategy, email marketing. So that's about uh, 10 years of doing those kinds of things. So what people normally like to have me speak about is search and analytics. And so I've given many hundreds, probably, of presentations on those topics. And what we're going to do today is kind of a combination. Good to see you, Diddy. Of all of, of all the analytics stuff that I know, packaged up in the most sensible way that I know how to organize it. It's a lot of stuff. This is kind of like we back up the truck and unload all the analytics insights that we have. This is like the proverbial knowledge bomb of analytics information. These slides are for you. If you have a thumb drive, we're going to give them to you before I leave today. I will upload them, or, or Hope has them already. We're going to make sure that you have the latest version of this entire deck. You can use it however you want. Give this presentation anywhere that you want if you find that useful to you. Doesn't matter. It, it's, I consider it your property now that you're here. Uh, it takes the pressure off for taking notes. So don't feel like you have to take notes for everything or remember exactly what was done specifically because most of these slides show you exactly step by step where to find every one of the insights. If you can actually just sit back and just absorb, just let the content wash over you and knowing that it's just an introduction to concepts. You don't have to internalize all of these things all at once. In fact, that would be crazy to try to learn all, you know, 18 years of analytics stuff in three hours. That's kind of nuts. I'm purposely going to overload you a little bit because that's as much value as we can offer. And all you have to do is know that the, this is the kinds of things you can do and later just open up the slides and find out exactly how to do that thing because this, this deck includes all the details for every process. Sound good? So the reality is, that it's almost ubiquitous. I'm surprised that this number isn't even higher. Most websites, the vast majority of websites, have Google Analytics installed. So what you're learning today, they're almost, they've won, basically. Right? It's a free tool. Actually, there's two versions. There's Google Analytics 360, which is a paid version, which is like, I think, $120,000 a year. Then there's the free version, which costs nothing. There's no in-between. There's only two versions of Analytics. And almost everyone uses this. And because it's free, they've kind of dominated and they've won. And like, why wouldn't you use this? There's very few reasons why you wouldn't want to use analytics. The fact is, though, the, the people that we meet, very few of them have analytics set up properly. So what you're going to get today is going to be, if nothing else, tips on how to set it up well to get more value from it. Also, I don't find this surprising. In surveys of employers, when they ask what are the skills gaps between their team's skills and what they need, or when hiring managers are asked what are the skills gap between what the candidates have and what they need, the biggest skills gap is in analytics. The things you're learning today fill in a blank space and a blind spot in the market in general and will make you more valuable to your current clients, to your current employers, to yourself in your careers for the rest of your careers. This is exactly the thing that is the most important skill, the, most missing, the, most, the biggest missing piece in people's skill sets going forward. Right? So if it's not on your LinkedIn profile, it should be there tomorrow morning because I want you to add that because that, this, is, this is why we're here, right? So the first, I want to begin with this. First, a quick understanding of how Google Analytics actually works. I mentioned I did analytics back in the old days before, there was, before Google finished winning, and it was a very different mechanism for tracking. Today, it's actually interesting that it works at all. It's kind of hacked together. In my mind, analytics is built out of like duct tape and string. It's weird that it works. This is how it actually, this is what happens. Visitor on a device goes to a website. That website has code, including a tiny piece of JavaScript code, and that code gets triggered when the page loads. The JavaScript is triggered. 
and it talks to, it actually reads from and writes to five cookies on that device. It's based on JavaScript and cookies. Then the JavaScript reports back to Google's data, to Google's servers, actually store all this information, right, and then we log in and we get to see the reports. This is how it all works. Or this is why, when it doesn't work, why it doesn't work. The reason is, it's based totally on JavaScript and cookies. That is not 100% reliable, right? There's lots of reasons why that won't work. For example, that person doesn't accept cookies. They're invisible. We don't know. They never, it's like they never visited. They didn't exist. Analytics has no clue. There is no way to track them. Or they didn't have JavaScript enabled. Also, it only knows when the JavaScript is triggered. The default setup for analytics doesn't know how long they were anywhere unless the JavaScript is triggered again. You go to a page in analytics, the JavaScript loads. You, said you spend, let's say, three minutes on the page. You click to go to another page. That JavaScript loads. It knows you were on the first page for three minutes. Let's say then you close the tab after 15 minutes. How long were you on that second page? No idea. It has no idea. How could it know? It only knows when the JavaScript is triggered, right? It does not know how long we are on the last page we visited. It's just not there. <laughs> it doesn't have this information, right? That's exactly how it works. Time on page, or even are they on the same tab? Are they on the active tab? Is it a different tab? It has no idea. Or is it someone using, is it someone else using my computer? It doesn't know. Or is it me using different computers? It doesn't know. A visitor is actually a device, right? I've got a phone in my pocket. I've got a laptop there. I go to your website from both different things. I'm two different people. It couldn't know. It would have no way of knowing. These are inherent limitations with the mechanism for tracking in analytics, which is based on JavaScript and cookies. Okay? So these are fundamental reasons. Now, another, so this is the obvious problem I just mentioned. Someone comes to the website on a tablet, they do a deep dive on a desktop, they buy on the desktop, later they buy again on the laptop, and then they're going to engage with you on, um, you know, they like your stuff or something on their phone. These are like different people. It really has no idea. You start out the hipster, now you're this guy over here, you end up like, it has no clue. How could it? Unless you can get the person to log in, and then you can push what's called a user ID and you can try to connect the dots a little better. But normally it doesn't know if they're on different devices. Also, it is totally based on the URL. A person comes to one page, they spend time on that page, maybe they keep interacting with the page. If the new page doesn't load, if it's the same URL, which is a disaster, for tracking success, or conversions we'll call them, you'll, you'll see we're calling conversions, if it's a multi-step multi process on the same URL. I come to your site, step one, I'm entering my information, step two, I'm entering more of my payment information, step three, I'm reviewing this stuff and I'm finished and it says thank you. If that's all one URL, it doesn't know if I made it halfway or what percentage of people completed, no idea. It is completely based upon the URL. URLs are the unit of currency on the internet, as we'll see. So these are, these are inherent issues that you can try to solve if you have a multi-step process on any website, and I'll mention these even in a very short process, like, a, like a, a lead gen form submission, the person completes a form and lands in another page, that page, that thank you page, should have a separate URL. If you have a multi-step process that has multiple URLs, you get reports like this in analytics which can then track what percentage of people moved on. It's called the step drop report. If, you have a process, if your website just puts this all on one page, you never get this report. You can't see what percentage of people dropped off or where they went or anything else. So that's one of the issues. It only knows when people move from page to page. In other words, Google Analytics has no visibility into non-page view interactions. Here's an example. Someone in my office made this for me. It's kind of just a fake page that combines a lot of different types of interactions on it. So this is a carousel. We've seen these before. You can slide left and right or maybe navigate with these. Or you can click on these jump links and you can jump down the page and now you're on this product and you can click to change the color of the product or here are some different sizes. You can click to choose different sizes or leave the site and go buy it on a third party site like Amazon or you can share from here. You can, maybe there's a video you want to watch. You can watch the video or open those accordion content things or click on these tabs or navigate with the map or leave a comment or email, download some third party files or chat. You can scroll of course as well. How many of these interactions are tracked in Google Analytics? One, the page loading. Nothing else it knows. It knows nothing else here, right? These are all non-page view interactions. These are all clicks that don't count. Here's my ultimate list of 17 different clicks that just don't count in Google Analytics. You have to do special setup things. You have to create something called events. You have to do a little bit of coding to actually be able to see any of that stuff. This is the nature of GA. Make sense? 
A lot of people have sort of assume that it does much more than it does. It actually can only do certain things, and that's why. JavaScript talking to cookies, duct tape and string. It's weird to me that it's, like it's totally hacked together. The whole thing is just like a giant hack. That's not what JavaScript and cookies were meant to do, right? It's so weird that it works, I think. So jargon, I'm gonna, so just to define some terms at the very beginning, in analytics, they do not call anybody a visitor anymore. Ever since analytics rolled out, universal analytics that, that does analytics for websites and for apps, they decided to unify the language. People, that, people on software are called users. People on websites are called visitors. It just calls everybody a user now. You'll hear me use them interchangeably. We all use them interchangeably. But everything in analytics is now called a user, every person. And if someone does go to the website, it's called a session. Users and sessions. All the language you'll see in there is called users and sessions. And then I mentioned also the difference analytics when spelled with a small a. I can't even type it with a small a anymore. Like my finger just doesn't do that. I always give it a capital A. It's actually a Google product that we're talking about. But there's other types of analytics. There's all different types of analytics. I'm going to touch on at least one of them um, in this presentation. So I'm going to go through a bunch of setup things. I'm going to go kind of quickly because hopefully you guys have most of this stuff done well so that we can get into more interesting stuff, the actual analysis type stuff. So first of all, unless you have done this one extra step, you are polluting your own, your own data. So this is the channels report, acquisition channels, acquisition all traffic channels. And it shows this thing over here, this left column, it's called default channel grouping. Search, direct, social, referral, email, you should probably see all of these in there. But it's possible that you are actually in your own analytics Traffic, direct traffic may include you or people from your office if you have not yet filtered out people from your office. How do you filter out people from your office? In the admin section, there's three things in here. Accounts, properties, and views. Accounts have properties, properties have views, like grandparents have parents and parents have children. That's, this is kind of nested. Inside the views, there's a way to add filters. That's where you can filter out traffic from a specific IP address, a specific location. Suppose I worked here in this co-working space and I don't want, you know, and I'm on my website all day long or I'm testing my own forms. I don't want to affect my conversion rates or my goal setting. I can filter myself out by going to this and simply typing in the IP address of my location. There's other ways to put in special characters to remove ranges of IP addresses and other things. But basically you want to put in your IP address there. How do you find out what your IP address is? <coughs> Go to Google and search for what is my IP. Megan knows this already. Copy and paste that number into that box and you have filtered yourself out of your analytics. It works only if your network gives you a static IP address, an IP address that doesn't change every time you load your computer. If you're at home and you have RCN and you unplug your router and plug it back in, it might give you another IP address. You can check to see if it changed. Copy that into that box. Your analytics got forever more accurate. I also think that this should be done by default. It's super weird to me. I actually know some of the Google Analytics um, product team members. Uh, Adam Singer is a guy I see at conferences and he's like the team lead for analytics. And uh, he gave me a weird reason why they don't do this. I don't agree with him. I think they should do this. Exclude traffic from robots, right? Why wouldn't we just always want to exclude traffic from robots? If you have a very low traffic site, it actually can affect your stats. Look at this, referral, direct, organic. Look at the referral traffic. It's like most of the traffic on this site is referral traffic. Click on referral to drill down and you'll see all the websites that are sending you traffic. The, referral, the referring websites are buttons-for-website.com and best-seo-offer.com. That looks super shady, right? That can't be legit. <laughs> no way are these people. Why would 154 people have come from buttons-for-website.com? That's weird. They're robots. They're definitely robots. So the, the way to get these out of your analytics is from view settings, scroll down, check this box. It says bot filtering. Exclude all hits from known bots and spiders. ICANN stands for the International Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, governing body for the internet, manages a giant list of all known robots. Google Analytics pulls from that list if any of the visits for sessions from user agents that have that, I, that user agent name, it will exclude that traffic. So just go check that box. Your analytics will be, forever be more accurate. That is really weird to me that that box isn't checked by default. Adam Singer gave me some bizarre justification for it. Next, we have to set up goals. It, there's, websites can be programmed in many different ways. Therefore, analytics does not know by default what success looks like. You have to tell analytics what success looks like on your site. 
and you do so by setting up goals. So these are all different types of conversions. We wrote a book about digital marketing and in there there's like 13 of them. There's all different types of successes, different conversions, desired outcomes, actions where when the visitor takes them, they are now no longer a visitor, they're like something else. They converted, like in the term like a religious conversion, like they're not the same anymore. They were a visitor, now they're a lead. They were a visitor, now they're a subscriber. They were a visitor, now they're a customer or a registrant or a donor. We all converted, right? You all converted to, or you wouldn't be here. Conversion, that's why we call it that. It's success. It's the outcome, the desired outcome for a visit. So analytics, we have to tell it what, that, what success looks like so we can get smarter. We can see what tends to convert, what doesn't convert, what pages support conversions, what pages don't support conversions. So this is where we get the importance of the thank you page. Look at this, okay, request a demo. I fill this out, I'm a lead, right? I'm on some random website, I blurred them out. I try to blur out people that are guilty of analytic crimes. So, so whatever this site was, you, you fill this out, you click to send a demo request, and then what happens? What should happen if I, if I check that box? Or if I, check, if I click that button? Go to a thank you page, right? Or maybe this happens, I get a thank you message. I hate thank you messages, right? Why? There's no URL. There's no page loading. There's no JavaScript triggered. There's no talking to cookies. There's no, there's, it's not easy to track this conversion. The thank you message is on the same page. A lot of people do this. They build like, uh, like pop-up forms that say subscribe to this thing and you fill it out and then it, the pop-up just goes away but you're still on the same page. Very difficult to track success that way, right? So we don't want the thank you message. We would rather have a thank you page. Here, another reason why goals are hard to measure. Wow, that is a sweet ride. I want that car. I'm going to buy that car. I'm going to contact Meredith and convert. Meredith, I got my checkbook out. I'm coming to put my down payment down, right? I click on that email link. What happens? Launches my Gmail account or something, right? I'm not on the website anymore. Outlook opens up. All kinds of weird, you know, whatever my browser is set to do when I click on an email link. There's definitely not a web page loading with analytics JavaScript code. Email links are horrible for, for analytics. So contact forms have none of those disadvantages. A contact form with a thank you page is awesome marketing. Thank you pages, though, should be a little bit better than this. Your thank you page should give people an option. We, give the, we do this. Get our, our thank you page on our contact form. It says, would you like to get our best advice every two weeks? There's a subsequent conversion here. It's way better than just saying goodbye. If your thank you page just says two words, go fix it. It's lame. Like, that's sad. Like, you might as well just tell people to leave, to, you know, go away. We get hundreds every year. We get hundreds of people subscribe to our newsletter from that thank you page. It should be a rabbit hole, right? Give them more, more interactions. Go to your website and pretend you're a super fan and try to do everything offered. And if it's like one thing, like, you're not very, you know, everyone has super fans. So anyway, yeah, this is, and I can measure this one specifically. Look at the name of this goal. The laser? Yeah. Uh, newsletter subscriber from page. And I'm tracking that as a separate goal. Boom. Exactly how many people, what percentage of people complete that secondary subsequent conversion of the thank you page. Event tracking. Can't you track? You guys are like perfect segues. I should just go to the next slide before answering questions to see if I've got it. <laughs> what about all those things? Aren't they trackable? I'm going to show you now the turbo version, I sped up this video 300% to show you how to do exactly what you suggested by setting up event tracking the proper way using a tool called Google Tag Manager. Who's heard of Google Tag Manager? Okay, rather than putting analytics code on every page, rather than putting new uh, Optimizely code on every page or Hotjar or HubSpot or whatever your tools are, you can use a tool called Tag Manager to manage all of the tracking code from one place. First thing you need to do is to go create the variable. Set the variable to be the click URL. In this case, this is literally like a high-speed video. Then I'm going to go create the tag. The tag I'm going to create is the universal Google Analytics tag. I need to put in my tracking ID. In order to find the tracking ID, it's right there under the JavaScript tracking code in the admin view. Now I'm going to set the track type to be event. All events have three things, categories, actions, and labels. The event is going to be a, uh, a link, a link click. I'm tracking exit, exit clicks, so this is when people leave the site. So I have the click URL as the label. I'm calling it offsite event tracker. Where, do I, where does it fire? And I'm creating the trigger. The trigger is going to be on every page. That's what I said a second ago to make it on every page. Now I'm going to come in. It's going to be what, when does it act? When the click URL is not contained on the website, I'm tracking all offsite clicks. It's an offsite link event tracker. And I set the uh, value to that be one. And then I click publish. 
don't forget to publish. Also, you should be naming and putting a container to say that you did that properly. Pain. Don't have to do that. Forget that. That is what you have to do if you want to create all those things, right? It's like a careful work done by an expert. Not necessary. You know, yeah, would even, even if I did that, I'd miss the opportunity to do things like subsequent conversion. Thank you, Paige. That now, but when you do that, now you do get the event tracking. This is the event report that shows all those events. That was a mouthful. We don't have, let's, let's, not, let's never do that again, <laughs> unless absolutely necessary. So only 41% of websites that we analyzed, we, we downloaded a list of top websites and checked to see what percentage of them you're using Google Tag Manager. It's only 41%. Build up, get yourself some GTM skills, and you'll be ahead of the curve. So we're going to use thank you pages, because so, that wasn't necessary. Five things happen when a visitor converts on a, on a well-built website. I'll give you a thank you page with additional messaging or links to other content. They get an auto-response email saying, thanks for submitting our contact form. We'll be in touch within 24 hours, whatever you say. It sends email notification to the sales associate or the business owner saying, yes, thank you. No, you got a lead. It saves them to a database, CRM, whatever the tool is, and it records as a conversion analytics. This is what a good website, this is all the things that a website should do when a person converts. Make sense? So actually that tip though is useful. And that thank you page was a dead end. Think about it this way. Websites are filled with dead ends. Go look at your website and ask if there's any dead ends. Well, a simple marketing goal, a fast way to get better results is to find and fix every dead end on your website. Scroll to the bottom of all of your pages and ask yourself what you want that visitor to do at the bottom of that page. Do you put calls to action on every page? Do you put links to related content on every page? Or do your sites just end with a sad, lonely footer? Most sites do. User, the, even if you never look at it, the user's flow report in analytics, is a, the name of it is a clue. The goal is to keep these people flowing through the website. Guide them, take them by the hands, to help them find things, right? Yeah, so most websites have dead ends and uh, it's bad marketing. So this is how to set up goals. In the view, there's a place to click on goals, and the goal destination is equal to the URL of the thank you page. I recommend setting an, a value, even if it's an arbitrary value, of $1. There's a report you don't get if you don't put any number in there. And then the next thing you would do is to turn funnel on. This was one of the sites I talked, one of the companies I talked to this morning hadn't done this. Uh, we did it together. Turn funnel on and tell it what the previous step was. Contact, right? You don't have to have a funnel, but if you make a funnel and you require it, you're going to get a re that report, the funnel visualization report that shows you where people came from. So set the previous step. Now you get conversions. How many people took action? If you have not set up goals, it's so common. If you haven't set up goals, it, this, is, this report is empty. There's no conversions that will say goals are, are zero. Now you get the conversion rate. What percentage of people who visit your website take action? That's like the effectiveness of the mousetrap. You know, this is the percentage of people that take action. This is the, the whole game is to, well, there's two, two jobs we have as marketers. Increase the total number of visitors and increase the percentage of people who take action. That's, you know, marketing is the cheese and web design is the mousetrap. Everything that we do as digital marketers should be designed specifically to affect either the traffic or the conversion rate or why would we do it? That's the job. That's the whole job, right? I only, I'm only partly kidding when I say that I want my son to be good at two things, SEO and CRO. If he's good at search engine optimization and conversion rate optimization, that kid will be rich, right? Those are the only skills you need in life. If you're good at those, you're a growth hacker. You're a dual threat marketer. This is like, and I, we had a speaker last night at our, Adam Bianco, another digital megaphone speaker, was, spoke, was speaking at our event, Wine and Web, and he's an Instagram expert. And I think it's a lovely social network I do not understand it as a B2B marketer. You can't even link to things. I don't get it. Like, why, where, <laughs> what, what, you don't go anywhere. Like, brand awareness? I guess for B2C, brand awareness. Yeah, I'm biased against things that don't drive traffic or c convert an increasing percentage of visitors into leads. I mean, this game for two things, attract visitors and convert them, because that's money, that's leads, that's the opportunity to sell. Marketing qualified leads. So if you do put a number in there for the, for the value, I put a dollar, you saw me put a dollar, then the value of each page shows up this, on this far right column when you look at your all pages report, right? Every page, if a, if a lead is worth a dollar, a visit to this page is worth 16 cents. A visit to that page is worth three cents. 
that page is worth two cents. You get the idea. If you did not set a value, those are all zeros. You got a giant blind spot, you left it empty, there's nothing in your, in your page value column. That's the value of each page. Okay, you also get the previous, the goal previous, uh, the reverse goal path report, which shows you this is the thank you page, the destination. This is what people were doing right before they came to the thank you page. Very useful, we'll use that later. The funnel visualization report, like I showed, 71.5% of people went from the shopping cart to the checkout. Those that didn't went there. 78% of people made it to the, the, the thank you page, the receipt. All of this is empty unless you've set up goals. So I can see the conversion rate now. Now this is a report that you just can't do marketing with. I'm not sure how to do marketing without this report. This is the sources of traffic. And this is the conversion rate, the percentage of people who converted it from each source of traffic. People from, people from one half of 1% of people from search convert. Email, 0.7% of people from email, right? Click on any of these to drill down, and then you go into reports, click on social. This is a list of social networks, and what percentage of people from each social network convert? Imagine trying to do social media without that data. It's ridiculous, right? It's like, drive, it's like put on a blindfold and drive your car around town. Like it's insane, right? Like that would be so weird. Facebook, 0.4% of people from Facebook convert on this website. LinkedIn, one, more than 1% 1 of people from LinkedIn convert on this website. Translation, time spent, effort, resources, investment in LinkedIn is worth 2x times uh, the time spent in Facebook. How would you know how to budget your time? How would you know how to budget your own time, much less dollars against on, on, on social media if you didn't know which social media network triggered which type of action? There's a drop down up here where you can set the type of goal and you can see the traction for each source of traffic against each type of goal and then measure performance. One in three marketers doesn't know which tactic has the biggest impact. Ouch. <laughs> it's amazing, right? I've got no idea where I'm going. I just drive around town. Like it's so weird that people just keep doing that thing, right? Like they just, it's like habit. So these are some quick tips for improved conversion rates. Add social proof to your top pages. Got an amazing testimonial? Put it on the most popular page. Make sure each page is a call to action. Add people, add personality. Short, simple forms correlate with higher conversion rates. Not always true, but typically speaking, longer forms uh, add friction and lower conversion. Really the re main reason why people take action on websites is because they found the answer to their questions. The website did its job at giving that visitor the information they came for. This is our tip for, conver for our testimonials, by the way. These are the seven things we recommend adding to any testimonial. If for a B2B company especially, you're gonna put the logo. Also, I got this tip, this, uh, maybe we talked, remember, did I talk about this before, testimonial formatting? Take the juiciest five words out of the testimonial and make it a headline above the testimonial. It increases the visual prominence, makes it more likely people will actually read it. There's a good reason why Amazon makes you write a little headline for every book review. Pull that out and make that, right, and then take the testimonial itself, make the person human, there's John, he works there, there's his company, and also this is me being sneaky because you know I'm an SEO. A keyword focused testimonial is one of only four tactics I know of in all of digital marketing that increase traffic and conversion at the same time. This is both mousetrap and cheese. You got a page that isn't ranking or isn't converting, add five new keyword focused testimonials to that page. Trust me, <laughs> that is, that's killer marketing. At, you know, how many of your pages have social proof? Do you have pages with no evidence? Look at any page on your website and count the number of unsupported marketing claims you make. Very common. People constantly making just unsupported marketing claims. Support every one of your marketing claims with evidence, as in a third party endorsement, as in social proof, as in testimonial. Okay, I'm gonna add now campaign tracking code. This is one of the other setup things that we need to do uh, accurately. This is a company, for example, that's active in email marketing. They get traffic from email. Where's the traffic from email? Not there, not there. Wait, where are my email visitors? No idea. Really, email traffic should be separate. It should be tracked as a separate thing in this default channel grouping, that first column again. There they are. The way that you get your email traffic out is to add campaign tracking code. Is anyone here already doing this? A few. Maybe not everyone. Of course, I hope you have impacts here. They're pros at this. So 
OK, here's an article that I wrote. It's called How to Set Up Google Analytics with Five Quick Videos. There's a link to the article right here. There's a link to the article right here. If you click on those links, you go to the article. Up at the top when you landed here, I don't know if anyone pays attention to this, but there's a whole bunch of extra stuff up there in the address bar. All of that weird stuff is there for no reason at all except for Google Analytics to know where this person came from. The way that that stuff gets in there is you let MailChimp kind of do it, or Constant Contact, or your whatever your ESP is, kind of do it. Or you can do it by hand, or you can use one of these tools. We, there's tons of these out there. Amanda is an orbiteer. She wrote a great article that explains how to do this. It's basically just adding three things. First, here's the article, website.com slash article. Then I'm going to add the source, the medium, and the name. The source is the newsletter. The medium is email marketing. The campaign name is my August email. All that does is put these things in down here after these little, these are called parameters. UTM source equals, UTM medium equals, UTM campaign equals. When those appear in the URL, analytics can see it and grab it and report on it. Here's other, now you use these campaign tracking codes not just for email, you use them for any specific effort to bring visitors to the website, such as an ad. Here's an example for like a Facebook ad. Medium is the broadest origin of traffic, like paid or pay per click or cost per click. Source is the specific origin of traffic. Maybe even you can call it branded, like MailChimp or Facebook. Please always use a lowercase. It matters. It'll show up differently. As a general rule, always use lowercase in your campaign tracking code. Campaign name is the specific marketing effort, spring sale. Here's a newsletter, email, MailChimp, April newsletter. Here's a Twitter campaign, cost per thousand, Twitter, event registration. All you have to do is put that in there, and now you get this report under acquisition, all campaigns. Now you see exactly what you wrote in that campaign field right here. Now I can see, look at my email traffic. It's like a work of art. Isn't that beautiful? It's like a, it's like a medical TV show, right? It's like bloop, bloop. It's like a heartbeat. That's what good email traffic marketing looks like. Without that, your email traffic would appear all over the place. It's not segmented out. With it, you get bounce rate. Oh, wow, these people were more engaged with that one than that one. Pages per visit. Wow, people who clicked on that one tended to see more pages. Time, time, on, uh, time for their visit, their conversion rate. You can measure the performance of each campaign. Imagine trying to do email marketing without that. It'd be impossible. Now, I have this debate with this very famous marketer, I won't name names who thinks that you, should, you can add campaign tracking on internal links inside websites? Not the right way to do it. Because if you click on, a cam, if, uh, if you click on one of those links, it overwrites all the actual cam, uh, source information. The medium is overwritten. The source is overwritten. Campaign tracking code is meant on external links that bring people to the website. Never, never use them on internal links between pages on a website. You all know this person. And he's never going to agree with me, but he's wrong. We, <laughs> this is the, the wrong, wrong place to use them because it overwrites the actual source information. It double counts visits. Site search setup. Who here has a little search box on their website? Cool. Most of us do. So uh, I have a hilarious example of this. Um, I don't have slides for it, but I was uh, canceling RCN service the other day. This is really funny. If you want to cancel, who has RCN? Right, or Comcast, whatever. These are the two local. If you want to cancel RCN, you have to go to their like help center. And if you start typing in cancel, it shows you that's the number one search, and it has like 30,000 people have searched for that. <laughs> right below it says top searches. Cancel is the number one searched for thing on that website. So go ahead and search for cancel. Guess what? There isn't a page about canceling. There's a page called change your service. It doesn't mention canceling. If they, they lack, they, they obviously, right, there's demand for the topic. Maybe, I'm not sure if they aren't using it properly, but they would, I mean, you can see at a glance that it's the top search. What I'm going to suggest to you now is that you use that little, that little search box, not as a service to your audience to help them find what they want, but as a listening tool for you to get ideas for what to publish or what to create or how to, opt, you know, how to help people find things. Here's how it works. Again, account, property, view. Under view, there's view settings. Down at the bottom, you have to toggle on the site search tracking. The next thing you have to do is enter what's called a query parameter. We saw parameters a second ago. They're that string 
strings of things at the end of the URL. So I just go to the website and I search for analytics, and then voila, analytics suddenly appears up there in the address bar. Almost always does. Drupal sites sometimes don't, but usually does. Right before that is a little character. On this website, it's an S. S is the query parameter. Other sites have other query parameters. Sometimes it's like search term. Sometimes it's keyword. People build websites in different ways, and the programmer might choose something else for the query parameter. It's just something that the programmer decided that day. And Google, if you're like a huge nerd like me and you analyze all this weird stuff inside the Google URLs, Google's query parameter is Q. Anyone ever notice that? Yeah, you read that every day, right? You're always like analyzing that, all that stuff. No, no one is. So you end up, so all you do then, turn site search on and type in your query parameter into this. Some sites I saw a site yesterday that had two query parameters, one for the global site search and one for the blog search. There were two different ones. Put a comma, you can separate them. So then now you get a report called search terms. Look, I'm in behavior now. I'm in the behavior section, what people do. Site search, search terms. In search terms, this is site search for a, a travel website. And it's amazing. Wow, I can see everything people search for on this website. Data-driven empathy. That's digital marketing. That's the, if you were to take one note today, write that one down. Data-driven empathy. That's what analytics really is. That's what digital marketing really is. Using data to make better decisions to understand our audience better. This is data-driven empathy. People are looking for New Orleans and Hawaii and Costa Rica and Packing List and Belize. Great. Now I'm going to show, these are all the things that people want on that website. I'm going to show you a little analytics hack that gives you way more insight beyond this. So this, here's some uh, jargon. This thing, this first column here is called the, the dimension. These, all this stuff over here is called metrics. Everything in analytics is either a dimension or a metric. That's all there is. There's nothing else in here except dimensions and metrics. The first dimension over here is called the primary dimension. But there's a way to add another one using that dropdown. So I want to show you how to use uh, secondary dimensions. What did we do? We added goals. We used campaign tracking code. We set up site search. We filtered out traffic from ourselves. And we excluded all traffic from known bots and spiders. I think that's it. We didn't need event tracking because we have thank you pages. That is mostly, that's about 90% of what anyone needs to do inside Google Analytics setup. And all those things are set it and forget it, do it one time and you're done. I guess campaign tracking code, you might do it each time. Most of that stuff is, it's done, it's correct, and you don't have to worry about it again. So here's, here's my, uh, my mini rant about analytics in general, and I think the biggest problem with the way people use it. This is what most people do in analytics, and it's sad, and I worry, and this is um, depressing to me. What they do is they wake up in the morning, they look at their favorite report, and the line goes up and they smile, or the line goes down and they frown, and then they go back to checking their email. That's what most people do in analytics. It's called reporting. <laughs> and it does nothing for your marketing. Pretty reports do not affect marketing. You can do this every day and nothing will happen. You never get smarter, your marketing never improves, you never increase traffic or maximize your conversion rate. All you did was look at a report that went up or down. This is why it drives me crazy when people ask me these questions like, how often should I check analytics? I don't, how, how, it's like, check it as often as you have a question. How often do you look at the dashboard on your car? Well, every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock I go downstairs and open the garage and look at the dashboard on my car. That's insane. Why would you do that? Why do you look at the dashboard on your car? Because you need to know how fast you're going, if you have gas, is the engine running hot, right? Because you, you, you have a practical reason to look at it. Looking at reports, when people say, how often should I look at it, or what reports should I look at, I, have, I don't know how to talk to those people. I'm very confused when I talk. Like, it's strange to me. This is how to use analytics. You have an idea. Wow, we should double down on Instagram. Ask a question that supports that idea. Do we get any traffic from Instagram? Find the report that provides the answer. The all channels report, drill down to social. No, you get no traffic from Instagram. OK, either proceed with the idea. Yeah, let's go for it. Maybe we can affect that number. Or reject the idea. Hmm. Maybe Facebook is a better place to, do our, to spend our time. That is called analysis. Reporting and analysis. Reporting does not affect marketing. Analysis is, is critical to success. So the rest of this next hour or so, we're going to ask, we're going to look, take, turn ideas into questions, ask, find the answers to those questions, and then take action and measure the impact. Well, I don't know why that's green. 
Avinash Kaushik taught so many of us how to use the analytics. He wrote Analytics 2.0, famous marketer, amazing keynote speaker, absolute expert. Uh, he puts it this way. He says, if you see a data puke, you know you're looking at web reporting. If you see words in English outlining actions, you're looking at web data analysis. Right? A data puke is reporting. English is analysis. Here's the example. So here's a quiz. Is that uh, a data puke or analysis? It's a data puke. That's a default data puke in Google Analytics. There's no insights there at all. It's just a report. Data puke or analysis? Data puke. Data puke or analysis? Data puke. Data puke or, <laughs> or analysis? This one's like the rainbow sherbet version of the data puke. It's like the rainbow bright unicorn data puke. Uh, data puke or analysis? That's Omniture. That's an extremely expensive data puke. You can pay a lot, you can pay a lot for these. Data puke or analysis? Analysis, look, an idea. A suggestion, an action, a reason, a why, right? Something to do. Data puke or analysis? Analysis, look, yeah, action, steps to take, move the dial, let's do something. Data puke, analysis, recommendations, let's do this, improve key terms, future growth, right? Analysis, actions, actions, you see the difference, right? So the idea is that we're gonna turn ideas into questions Find the answers and then take action because that affects your marketing. This is why we. This is why it's called Google Analytics because the word analysis is part of it. That is about reports. I, I couldn't. I don't find reports useful, per se. It's just extremely unlikely that some insight's going to jump off the page and you'll be like, oh my god, I just had never thought of that. That just doesn't happen very much. So here's how. Here's how it's all organized. I've been kind of walking you through it a little bit. There are five things here in the main reports. Audience, that's where you get the mobile information, but not as practical, I don't think. I focus on these three here at the bottom. Acquisition, behavior, conversion, literally. And it's also the shape of the funnel. Acquisition is people coming to the site. Brand awareness, the source of traffic. Behavior, the engagement, right? What they did, what are they doing here? What are they, how are they behaving? Conversion, what percentage of people took action, became a lead, converted? Right? That's, the or, that, that's the structure of Google Analytics. Here's the mobile, so I'm gonna ask, ask questions. Here's that first one, mobile visitors, mobile visitors. This is actually a, in the audience report, mobile overview. This is a lovely report because it only has three rows. The dimension, primary dimension, only has desktop, mobile, and tablet. I, I find it useful, so this is my little structure for this presentation as you go through. I put a little breadcrumb at the top of all these so you can find out exactly where these reports are. Just opening this deck will show you exactly where to answer every one of these questions for your own site. So, uh, I, I'm a fan of these guys down here. These are views, and you can change the view for any report. There's five views, sometimes there's six, it depends. So the pie chart view is a fun one for this. What percentage of our visitors are on mobile? There you go, there's your answer. 79% are on desktop, 17% mobile, 4% tablet. Very nice. Are mobile visitors less engaged? This is a better question, a more useful question. So, are mobile visitors less engaged? Okay, so I switched to the desktop, to the um, pie chart view. This other view here, I think is super powerful and totally underrated, it's the comparison view. I know very few pro marketers even who use that view, but it's so, it tells the story so fast. Are mobile visitors less engaged? When I switch to the comparison view, there's a drop down that lets me choose any of these metrics. The engagement metrics, let's call them these three. Bounce rate, what percentage of people that saw just one page? Pages per visit, pages per session, how many pages did they see while they visited? Average session duration, how long were they here? The answer, bounce rate, yeah, mobile visitors bounced a little bit more often, but not much, only 7% more. So the, next, so the next view is average session duration. Mobile visitors see, phone. mobile means phone here, Phone visitors see 21% fewer, uh, spend 21% less time. But look at the tablet visitors. They spend 20% more time. See the insights? I took it right from that drop down, or right from that uh, view, the comparison view. So examples of actions might be check the landing pages for mobile, keep checking this one over time. That was just a simple example of a tiny bit of analysis. Now we're gonna get a little bit more practical, a little bit deeper. What are your most popular pages? 
That's obviously in the behavior, right? What did they do? It's in behavior. Behavior, site content, all pages. This is one of the most popular, most important page, uh, reports in analytics. Here's an example. There are auto, this, these do jump out at you. They're, they're sorted by the number of page views. Some pages get a lot more visits than others. How many more visits? I'm going to switch to the comparison view. Boom. That page gets 22,800% more visits than your average page. This is, to me, very useful because let's say you have 11 minutes this month to do marketing. What should you do? Do something on one of these because these things are like 3,000% more popular than your average page. I know people who are like, oh, we have, you know, we're building a new website with Orbit and we have 1,000 pages and we're freaked out because we have to rewrite or move 1,000 pages. Do you really? Turns out you've got 20 pages that matter and 980 pages that nobody ever sees. There is never an example where, it, where things in digital marketing are equally weighted. <laughs> There's, it's, just never, it's all a question of priorities. We could do anything in our time. Why don't we do the things that matter the most? Trust me, every site I've ever seen looks like this. There's a tiny percentage of your pages that get the vast majority of your visits. It's a curve, right? It's like a hockey stick curve. Your analytics account probably looks just like this. Tips for top pages, make them great, right? Remove, you know, these are the pages that people visit a lot. So time spent on these page will give you 28,000% more value than time spent on the average page. Literally, from that last report we saw that. It's 28,000% more visible, so focus on these pages. Uh, this, is a, this destroys your, speaking of SEO, that's a major problem. If you have a page on your site called products, don't expect it to rank for anything, or services, what is that page about? If you have a page called services, this is a site that has a page called programs. It has all their programs. Which of their programs is the most popular? Who knows? They put them all in one place. Which of the, do, and they have eight programs on different topics. Which of their programs you know, will rank? You need to make a page per thing. Make a page for each thing. That's SEO. That's analytics. If you make one page that has all the things, the problem is you'll never really know which of those things is performing or isn't. This is also why we should never make a page called testimonials. Anyone here have a testimonials page? I recommend getting rid of your, OK, Hope has a testimonials page, but she has a very narrow site without millions of pages on it. So it probably does get quite a bit of traffic. I wouldn't be too surprised. Most websites that have lots of pages, testimonials, visitors almost never go there. It's obvious. It smells like marketing. They know what they're going to find. It's a bunch of happy people. It's far better. If you want these to be on this site, it's the 31st most popular page. It would be far better to, break, to get rid of this page and put testimonials on every page. Make sense? Oh, here we, we're back. What are visitors searching for on this website? I was going to do this, the secondary dimension thing. Travel website, people looking for locations. These are the phrases people are looking for. I'm going to show you now an awesome combination of reports. When you put them together, you'll get immediate insights. Looks like this. This is, I told you, the primary dimension. Up th now we're going to add more data to this report by adding a secondary dimension. The secondary dimension that goes great with the search terms, that's where we are, behavior, site, search, search terms, is a dimension called exit page. Where did they leave? So now I have the first column is the primary dimension. It adds another column for the secondary dimension, the exit page. Not weird, right? People search for New Orleans and leave from the New Orleans page. People search for Hawaii and leave from the Hawaii page. Not too surprised. People search for Belize and leave from Belize. But look, number six, people who search for packing list leave from the search results page. That's weird. Why would they leave without, from the search results page? They didn't click on anything? Right. They didn't find what they were looking for. This website doesn't have a packing list. This is why we call this the report of broken dreams. It's a list of all the ways in which your website is unsatisfying. Bye. Search terms combined with exit page shows you the things that people look for and then don't click on anything. If you see the search, the search, the search results page right there. Make sense? So obviously, right, we could, we could better optimize this page or this, this site by adding that. Here's an example. This is sad. Lighthouse Guild, it's a client of ours. Google knows that people want scholarships. But if you search for scholarships on their website, you don't find any scholarships. Scholarships is actually down there on page two of their own search results. Right? So this is like a type of SEO we should all get behind. <laughs> optimize your own content to rank in your own search tool on your own website. 
That's SEO, right? It's site search SEO. It's like the lost like stepchild, like the, the totally ignored cousin of SEO, but it's so obvious and so easy to optimize your own stuff. Or maybe you didn't even have that. So search for everything that you see in the search terms report. If your page wasn't ranking, go fix it. If you didn't have a page, go make it. Or maybe your problem is your navigation. Why are people searching for that anyway? Maybe you're not calling that thing. Maybe people are having trouble finding it. Now I'm going to show you how to see what people are clicking on in the navigation. This is really easy to find, but I think most people kind of miss it. I don't know many people that use this. Again, we're back in the All Pages report. I'm going to go to the Home page, for example, which is the top one with the slash. Click on the Home page. Now I'm looking at the Home page traffic. This is a one row report. Every report has the trend line and the data view. Trend line and data, right? This is the secondary dimension. This is where we can filter things. These are the different views. So now I'm just looking at the home page. Where do people go from the home page? There is a little tab up there that is easy to miss called the navigation summary. Click on the navigation summary, and it shows you, there's the home page, little icon, where people came from. 84% of people entered on this page. 16% of people started from somewhere else. This is where they came from. They, came, they got to the home page. Then where did they go? 70% of people left from this page, but 30% of people proceeded and went to these pages. At a glance, you can basically see what's performing and not performing in your navigation. Just go to the navigation summary for your own home page, look at the and then look at your site and see the six things you have in, the main level, in your main navigation. And you may know immediately, nobody ever clicks on number three. Very common. Maybe you should just remove that. We did the website for the Greater Chicago Food Depository. And they had like, um, like a get involved, like a donate thing. And they had an about us thing. And in between there was a little one called like hunger in our community. The navigation label didn't make a lot of sense to the audience. The page was amazing. It had lots of insights and data that made the case for the need of their services. It also had some mission and vision and story. We just took that page and blew it up. Put the stats on the donate page, put the story on the about page. Instantly all that content got seen much, much more. Because we took it off the page where, the, where no one was going. Every website has, is like, has, is like a, a city with traffic flowing through it. But most people don't know where the highways are or where the back streets are. If your website were a store, you were sitting behind the counter, you'd know where people were walking. Oh, that's, that aisle's always crowded. Oh, no one ever goes down aisle four. But people never look at this report, so they have no clue. <laughs> like, which of the things get clicked? What's not getting clicked? So without this report, the navigation summary, it'd be very difficult to optimize your navigation to get better results by removing things that aren't working or relabeling things that aren't working or making things easier to find. So very common. Small links getting clicked a lot or big buttons never getting clicked or calls to action that, are, that aren't working or what's work, what gets clicked a lot or what get, never gets clicked in the main navigation. Most people I know never really check out the navigation summary on their homepage. Never really know what's performing or not performing in their navigation. Make a couple of judgment calls the day the site goes live and then never look at it again for four years till they redesign the site. Kind of crazy. Everything that you remove is awesome because it makes everything that's left more visually prominent. Like a third of our clients, they fill out this contact, this uh, intake form that says like what sites do you like and don't like, the kickoff questionnaire. Like a third of them say they like Apple. What do you like about Apple? We like a clean modern design, that's what they all say. Why do you like a clean modern design? What are they saying? They like white space. They like minimalism. They don't like clutter. But then when you give them their website, they just keep adding more stuff to it without ever taking. Here's a tip. Never add anything to your website without taking something else away. Digital marketing is about making tough decisions. right? <laughs> so have the discipline to never remove something without, never add something without removing something else. So where do people go from page to page? By the way, if I'm trying to figure out where people go from another page, not the home page, home page is always at the top. But what about a different page? Uh, what if I don't see the page here? I could add 55, you know, 250 rows and then scan down this long list. But really the way to find things in these big reports, like these are all web addresses, this is the all pages report, is to just use a filter. So all I have to do is copy in, in this all pages report. If I want to see where people go from that blog post or whatever that thing is, all I have to do is copy and paste the URL in right there, and I find it immediately. 
trying to find my article about how to get more Twitter followers, which is a totally silly article that gets quite a bit of traffic. I just copy and paste the URL in there and it's going to help me find it fast. That's what that little filter box does. It's to filter down this report to show just the things in the, primer, in the first column that include that, those characters, right? This also, by the way, is why it's convenient if you're building a new site to make sure that all the blog content is in a directory called slash blog. I just have to type the word blog in this box and I'm just seeing all the blog posts. URL best practices. It's a very convenient structure if things are organized in that way, like folders. So now I can see where people go from this article about uh, how to grow Twitter followers. The top path through the website is its own separate report. It's under behavior, behavior flow. It shows you where people go from where. If you click on a, uh, the drop-offs are shown in red. The home page is, of course, the slash. Click on any of these pages and go to explore traffic through there. And you can see just people, for example, people who go to the home page, then tend to go there, then tend to go there. This is the map. This is the highways. These are the highways flowing through your website. A lot of website owners really don't know what the most common path is through your website. It's kind of an obvious thing, right? You should all know what the most popular path is through your website. You know, if I said, oh, I'm driving home and I'm going down Lakeshore or taking Ashland, you know which of those streets is a busier street, right? Everyone knows that. But people don't know that same information about their website because it's not physical or, visu or visual. So you can explore traffic through each of those and then basically see exactly what's working, what's not. Put billboards on highways. Oh, we spent a ton of money on that video. Put it where people would see it. Oh, that's an amazing testimonial. Put it where people would see it. Rebalance your navigation. Invest time in the top pages. Get rid of your testimonials page. OK. Now I'm going to start using uh, uh, filters to find more specific things and answer more detailed questions. For example, which blog posts have the highest bounce rates? I told you that I can, so I'm going to make an advanced filter. I told you that I can find every blog post by just typing the word blog into the filter box. But that's just filtering for one column. Suppose I want to find the blog posts that have high bounce rates. To filter for two columns, I need to do an advanced filter. It allows me to filter for anything that other than what's in the first column. The advanced filter looks like this. It reads like English. I recommend playing with these. I don't, it's very useful. So I'm going to just, just include the pages. See how this is green? Green things are dimensions. This is blue. Blue things are metrics. Include just the pages that contain the word blog. So all these will be blogs. And include where the bounce rate is greater than 80. That column over there is going to be bounce rate. And then I could keep adding more and more of these if I wanted to, to answer really specific questions to find exactly what I'm looking for. Right now I'm just trying to find the blog posts that don't keep people around. Then I just click on Apply. There they are, blog posts that have greater than 80% bounce rate. Make sense? It reads like English. The advanced filters. Which blog posts are the most engaging? We saw that the engagement metrics are these things over here, bounce rate and exit. So I'm under behavior, site content, all pages. I could use a filter to see just the, just the bounce rate right there, just to see just the blog posts. Here's all the blog posts. And then I can click the comparison view and again see all the blog posts for time on page. Some of these blog posts are way more engaging than others, right? This one's 26% more engaging than the average article. This is 88% more engaging than the average article. Getting any ideas? These are things maybe we should be focused on more. Wow, five of the top 10 are all on the same topic. That's what my audience wants from me. Data-driven empathy. This is what people would like me to do more of. Which of my blog posts are the most engaging? So publish more content on those topics. Or maybe you have something that's really awesome but no one knows about it. You can make the thing, you could just maybe do a better job promoting those. And then this is almost like a super obvious tip. I think this is like the, the secret formula in content marketing. Turn your top X into Y. Turn your top blog post into a video. Trust me, it'll be a huge hit. <laughs> that, that's definitely going to work. You know what your next greatest email subject line is? It was whatever your last, your most successful Facebook post was. If you use Facebook to go to Facebook Insights and see which post got the most engagement, use that as your next email subject line. It'll be a home run. Obviously, right? Turn the, turn the highest performing thing into a different type of thing. 
OK, which blog, oh, this is a really good one. Which blog posts inspire people to take action? So which blog posts are engaging, like people spend more time on those? This is actually more useful to me. Which blog posts inspire action? Skip that. The, conver the reverse goal path report, again, shows you where people converted and what they were doing right before they converted. Super cool, because we can choose any goal here. And I'm going to choose a goal from a blog post, which would more likely be blog readers don't become leads very often, but they do often subscribe. So I'm going to choose newsletter subscriber. This is the thank you page from newsletter subscriber, which is called blog newsletter thank you page. And I can see on this report what people were doing right before they subscribed. In other words, what were people reading before they signed up for the newsletter? This peop 76 people were reading this article about how to market an event before they subscribed. 28 people were reading how to improve your Google rankings before they subscribed. So this basically is giving you an idea for how inspiring each of these posts are. Useful, right? The problem with this data is these are raw, this isn't a conversion rate. That's the raw number of conversions. What I want to see is what percentage of people who read that article took action. Because some of these articles maybe got way more traffic than others. So, oh, here's a way to get more. So maybe to make goal previous step one, I can use a filter for that. So now I'm looking at just blog posts, just blog posts people read before they converted. This number of people were reading this article before they subscribed. But to get the conversion rate, I need to go find the total number of people who saw that article, the page views for the article itself. So watch this bit of magic, digital marketing analytics magic. This is the number of page views for these articles. This is the number of subscribers to each of those articles who subscribed after reading the article. Divide that number by that number, or which is it? Vice versa. I can't remember. I'm bad at math. And then you get the conversion rate, the percentage of people who subscribed after reading that article. This shows me the conversion rate for each specific piece of content. And look at the variance. It's huge, right? Some of these things are way more inspiring than others. Some of these convert nobody. Some of these convert a lot of people. So I made a bigger report that shows me all of them. In fact, I you know, put these on a chart and you can see this, even in the top 20, this one is like 5x or more, the, the, the 20th. And a lot of these websites have hundreds of articles, right? Here's a, here's a report that, gives, that does it for you, Clipfolio. Uh, it's a paid tool, but the 30-day free trial will, will, let, will make this report for you and show you the percentage of people who read each article and then converted into a lead. The minute you see this information, it will change your content strategy. That is what people love. That's what people act on. That's what inspires them. That's what converts them. More time spent on this is worth, you know, this is basically exactly what you should be driving traffic to. Here's the link to the, I did this together with them, so they put my name on it. This is the, the Clipfolio dashboard. The link is here. That'll take you to the Clipfolio dashboard that does that. So basically, our job is to find these top converting articles and then put on your traffic driving gloves and drive traffic to those things however you can. Link to those, these are your, these are your best mouse traps. Link to those from your top traffic pages. Connect your best cheese to your best mouse traps. One link will give you amazing results in minutes. The trick is just to find what is the top, what is the traffic champion and what's the conversion champion. If you know what your traffic champions are and your conversion champions are because from these reports, right? We did all of them. Creating just a related link, right? Or like further reading or learn more, like that link right there can give you better results in your marketing, grow your list very quickly. How else can you drive traffic to those? Put them back in heavy social rotation, relaunch it as another email again, link to it from anything else, buy an ad to it, put a link in your email signature, put it back on your homepage, put it back at the top of your blog, update, you know, make it a press release. Anything, right? Like, uh, I, I mean, we all know there's, I mean, how many ways can you drive traffic to something? You can, you probably all are thinking of ways now. I have my, like, a, uh, you know, you can put an update on your Skype account, what you're up to. Put the link there. You know, if you click on your Facebook header image, it pulls up a description. Put a link there. <laughs> like, how many places can you drive traffic? Use them all, because these things are the greatest mousetraps you've got. And also, obviously, your content strategy. Let that inform your content strategy. You can publish more on those topics. 
So connect to those traffic champs to the conversion champs. And it's so true. They're, they're, these things are never equally weighted. There's a small number of articles that get all of the, that, that attract more visitors than others. There's a small number of articles that convert far more visitors than others. I mean, you can, you can tweet or post anything on here. If you tweet this, the, the ability to affect the, the list growth is just a fraction of, of re, reposting that. You get the idea. So a minute ago, I showed us how to find our conversion champ, champions, right? the great, the great um, mousetraps. This next report, I'm going to show you how to find the best cheese, or rather, the, the almost great cheese. We're going to find the phrases that we rank for. And even better yet, we're going to find the phrases that we almost rank high for. I told you already I'm kind of an SEO guy and have been for a lot of years. So there is a report in analytics, a set of reports, called Search Console. Does anyone here, uh, anyone familiar with or regularly use a, a tool called Google Search Console? Yes, it's like a sister to Google Analytics. It's a companion tool. Google Search Console is a place where Google kind of communicates with you at the webmaster level. It used to be called webmaster tools. Like if there's like a penalty that you're under, or there's some alert or some errors or something, it, that's where you see, that's how Google communicates directly with website owners inside Google Search Console. It also has a set of reports called Search Analytics that if you set it up properly, you can connect Google Search Console to Google Analytics and see these reports without having to leave and go to Search Console. It shows you your top landing pages from SEO and your top queries, the phrases you rank for. I've never used these two in the middle, countries and devices. I really have no idea. So the queries report shows you all the phrases that you rank. This is amazing. People, people complain that Google doesn't show us keyword data anymore. Actually, there's tons of keyword data in Google. There's no more keyword data in the all traffic overview section, right? In the, if you click on organic, it, doesn't, it says not provided. Have you heard of this? If you do a search in Google and the search results show HTTPS for secure, then that data is encrypted and Google no longer shares the query, whatever you searched for, with the website owner. Years ago they gave us that information. Today they don't do it anymore. They're favoring privacy and anonymity, which we talked about. Google doesn't, they're trying not to be evil. So Google no longer shares the keyword data in that report. So you don't see any more the behavior, time on site and conversion rate and behavior metrics at the keyword level. They're all not provided. Go look at yours, like 98% of them are not provided. But this report, queries report, is still tons of keyword data. It just doesn't show you conversion rates and bounce rates and behavior metrics, right? But here they are. Look, all the phrases that you rank for and how high you rank. Amazing. <laughs> it's amazing information. So I'm going to show you how to now get even more insights from this very quickly by using an advanced filter. Again, you've seen me do this. If I type a word in, it filters the first column. If I click on advanced, I can filter any column. So I click on advanced. And I put in this little combination of, of options. This is very simple. Include where the average position, as in rank, is greater than 10. If your average position or your ranking is greater than 10, where do you rank? Page 2 of Google. You don't rank on the top page. You rank on the top of page 2, right? And you've heard the joke, where's the best place to hide a dead body? <laughs> page 2 of Google. This is basically me saying, hey, Google, show me all the phrases for which I rank high on page two. Voila. There it is. Sort by average position. This is a list of all the phrases for which you rank almost high. That is amazing. <laughs> that is really, really useful data. The next five minutes of my day, I'm going to do some incredible marketing because I'm going to improve the pages that almost rank high, helping them rank a little bit better ranking a little bit better is creating a lot more visibility because this thing already ranks at the top of page two. Going from the top of page two to the bottom of page one, I'm going to get like four times as much traffic to this page next week. This is all I have to do. And it's all a combination of this advanced filter on the, on the queries report. So now all I have to do is search for those phrases and find the page. And then, if you'd like, I can share a video where I explain how to do this in more detail. But I'm going to just improve the page. Make it a better page. Add detail. Add length. Add formatting. Add bullet lists. Add bolding. Add contributor quotes. Add examples. Add detail. Add statistics. Add anything. Add answers. Make sure the keyword appears in the title and in the header. Just make it a better page. I do this all the time, and it's the lowest hanging fruit in anyone's digital marketing. 
when you learn this skill, you're going to have so much confidence, you'll know that anyone that you meet, you can open up their analytics and open up WordPress and in 15 minutes improve their traffic. I'm not exaggerating. I've never seen an account that didn't have opportunities in here. So here's another question that we can ask. Again, question, answer, action. What phrases does that page rank for? I often want to, so let's say I'm going to, I'm going to improve that page that almost ranks high. But wait a minute, what if I reduce the relevance for another page that it's also ranking for? I have to be careful not to reduce the rankings for another phrase. So I want to maybe first answer this question. Show me every phrase that page X ranks for. I'm going to look now and find every phrase that any page ranks for. Here's how to do it. I go now to the landing pages report. Right there. These are all the pages that rank. A page won't appear here if it got zero visits. So these pages that rank. So let's say I want to, I just picked the page, this page about how to write testimonials. I click on that page. Now I'm looking at that page and it shows me every phrase that that page ranks for. That's it. Go to the landing pages report, click on the page, you've drilled down, and now it shows you every phrase that that page ranks for. Really useful. Very, very useful information. So let's say this page wasn't ranking that high and I want ideas about how to help it rank higher. Make sure that all of these different words appear on the page. Well, it's ranking number six or seven for these phrases, formatted and template. If the word template doesn't appear on there, maybe I should go add the word template to that page. These are clues for what to, how to make that a better page. It's a list of all the pages, all the phrases for which any page ranks. This page, by the way, this is something that uh, is not well understood from a lot of digital marketers and uh, it takes a while in SEO to figure this out, but any page that ranks, we all say, you know, choose the target key phrase and use the phrase in your title and header and body text as if you're optimizing for a phrase, right? Go look at the performance of any page that really does rank or rank well. This one ranks for 830 phrases. Not weird at all. Any page that ranks probably ranks for dozens or hundreds of phrases. That's normal, right? Google is a semantic search engine. It's not trying to match words and letters. It's trying to find people the best phrase, the best page on a topic. And any page that ranks for the topic probably ranks for dozens of phrases related to that topic. That's called semantic SEO. That's the future of SEO. Don't target the key phrase, target the topic by using all kinds of related phrases. That's a different presentation we sometimes do. Uh, super quick, we build websites. We have to answer this question. Does the site work well in every browser? Audience, technology, browser and OS. This is a list of all the, browser, all the browsers that have visited this website. There's the bounce rate for all the browsers. You can guess what I'm going to do. I click on the comparison tool. And this is the, the, compared to the site average, using the site as its own benchmark, this is the bounce rate for every different browser. In two seconds, I can tell you if your site has a problem in a browser without having to go to every device in every browser, just by looking at this report and, and looking at the bounce rate for each browser. This is that weird, so everyone that uses an Android phone, we were just talking about pixels. Yeah, everyone that uses an Android phone uses Chrome, right? They also make this really crappy browser called the Android browser. You should stop making that browser. It's a horrible browser. I'm not worried that there's a problem with that one. I, I'm upset that they still have that product. <laughs> what is the Android browser? It's called Android browser. It's, it's a button that says internet on, a, on an Android phone. It's like stupid. Definitely use Chrome, please, if you're using an Android phone. So I can kind of tell these people are having a tough time. By the way, Safari in-app, that's the browser that people normally install into their app. When you click on a link in an app, and now I'm like in a, you know, I'm in Twitter and I'm looking at a web page, that's the browser you're using. That's the app browser inside those, those apps. So go test the site on browsers that have high, higher bounce rates. Our visitors clicking on this carousel. Here's a non-page view interaction, the carousel, hot jar. Anyone that's a fan of this tool? <laughs> we need to hang out, yeah. If I had, didn't have plans, we'd be like toasting hot jar with beers after this. Hotjar is an inexpensive tool that fills gaps that Google Analytics has uh, where analytics doesn't work. And one of the things it does is it creates this heat map for clicks and heat map for scrolls. So I can see with color where people tend to click on any website. I have a carousel at the bottom of my home page. I'm not worried about it because our site converts like a champion. So I'm not, it, I probably should fix this though someday. This carousel, this 
this testimonial block has navigable carousel. You click to see the next one. This is a non-page view interaction, therefore Google Analytics has no idea what percentage of people click on this or don't because the page doesn't reload. There's no JavaScript triggered and it never set up event tracking. The only way to find that out is with a tool like Hotjar. What it shows me, so this is the second slide, look at that. Without question, choosing Orbit to design our website was the best decision I made in 25 years of being in business. I'd like for people to read that. I don't know why I made that the second one. How many people are actually seeing that by clicking on that thing? Only 5.6, only 6% only of people see that amazing testimonial. What if I just stacked these instead of making them carousels? Everyone scrolls, right? 100% of your visitors have their finger on a piece of glass or a trackpad or a scroll wheel. And it's much easier to scroll than it is to aim and tap. This is a hard, this is a heavier cognitive load. I have to aim at that thing, right? Scrolling, no, no problem. 28% of people scroll down past that testimonial. If I stacked these testimonials and put the second one underneath this one, that would be six and 28, four and a half times as many people would see it. Make sense? It's not hypothesis, that's data. I could, get, I could quadruple the percentage of visitors who see that second testimonial by stacking them. I almost never recommend anymore web, any website or web design or UX that has tabs or accordion content that expands or carousels that you need to swipe or timers, that, you know, basically we should make everything just tall pages. Never seen a study that showed that tall pages are less effective. I've seen many studies that show that um, visitors struggle to interact with things. They'd rather scroll. We're conditioned that way from social media websites. Which universities are visiting our website? This is a chance to get some more user level data. Regex, also known as regular expressions. I'm going to show you now a very simple way to do re use regular expressions, which is a advanced analytics. Audience, people that visit. Network, these are where people come from. This is the name of the network that people use to visit the website. It's actually passed along with the hit. Analytics does get information about the network. And the network is normally pretty boring stuff. Comcast, Time Warner, AT&T. We have a lot of visitors from HubSpot who visit our website. So these are people's, people, either their ISP or the company where they're from. This is for a higher ed website, or it's a company that does event planning for higher ed. And they want to know which universities are visiting their website. So how do I find just the college one and the university one? I'm going to show you now how to put multiple things into that box up there. That box obeys regular expression, which means we can use special characters to give ourselves more utility, more different features. College, pipe, that little vertical line. University, pipe. Institute, that means or, or. So that's just the fast way to filter down this report to show me any of these multiple things. I'm looking at the network report now to see just universities, colleges, and institutes. Voila, Dartmouth, University of Maryland, John Hopkins, right? That's actually the simplest, simplest type of regular expression. The pipe means or. You can't use commas, you can't use the word or. Just you put the word pipe and you can put in lots of things in there. You could also do it with an advanced filter. Matching regular expression. That's all it does. Include where the service provider, first column, matches the regular expression, college, university, institute. That's it. I'm going to show you, so regular expression is just a special text string that describes a search pattern used to find things. Now you at least you know what it is. That pipe, by the way, is just that key on your keyboard. That's how we get to that. So if you wanted to say either of my parents, you could say father, mother. Or if you're really good at this, you could say parenthesis, F-A, pipe, M-O, parenthesis, T-H-E-R. That means either of my parents. All of my parents and grandparents, grand, question mark, parenthesis, my parents, grandparents, great grandparents, etc. That's how regular expressions work. I'm bad at them, but I know that they're there. And if I'm looking for one, I can usually search and go find it. This is like technical programmer type stuff, but you can tell what people are doing here, right? We're kind of like getting in, like that's probably what I would use at the top. But yeah, you can write things that do all kinds of fancy stuff to show you very specific things. You're talking to a computer after all, right? This is an awesome question that analytics can ask, can answer for you that you can only answer with a regular expression. What long tail, have you heard of long, like 
SEO, there's like the head phrase and long tail phrase. And what long tail key phrases are we ranking for? For example, what four and five word phrases? There's very little competition for the four and five word phrases. Somebody who searches for a four or five long word, a five word phrase is looking for that very specific thing, the very targeted visitors. So if I go to the queries report in Search Console, oh, I forgot to mention, this report only gives you three months worth of data. I don't know why. Google will not give us more than three months of data for Search Console reports. This is weird. There's no data for the last two days, and there's no data older than three months. They're going to build a car that drives itself to the moon, whatever, like, but they won't give us more than three months of data. I don't understand. So I take all three, phrase, all, all three months, and this is, these are the phrases that we rank for, and I'm going to add this. I do not know what that means. It's mystery to me. It's like hieroglyphics. Who knows? Copy and paste that out of this presentation into the filter, and that basically is a regular expression saying, hey, Google, show me just the five plus word phrases that I rank for. There they are. That's great information for an SEO. Literally, it's like all the, like, there's almost no competition for some of these phrases. I love that. There are thousands of them, 8,644 of these phrases. I love it. So yeah, that, whatever that, that, that crazy thing is, copy and paste that up there as a filter, and it will show you just those, just those phrases. Really, really useful. So that was my quick crash course in regular expression. Are we losing people during checkout? Here's your step drop report. I can see what percentage of people I mentioned earlier are, are falling out of this process. This is the percentage of people who complete and don't complete. We're in the conversion goals funnel visualization report. If you have a shorter process with just like a lead generation form and a thank you page, you can still see what percentage of people are, are, are not completing the form. I remember the day, this was like 10 years ago, I looked at this report and saw that only 7% of people who came to my contact page were becoming a lead. I went and looked at the form. I was asking for like 11 fields. I was like, what's your job title and what industry are you in? I cut that form in half and doubled my leads that day forever after. Got the idea by looking at that report right there. That number changed my mind about marketing. Right? Simplify. So that's a very long funnel. Oh, this is one of those. This is one of those uh, showing the free quote. This is part of a super long funnel. Basic info, add driver, add additional driver, add vehicle. Oh, I love this one. I told you it's a work of art. Look at these 90 plus, 95, 99 percentile. Look at all these people. But then they get to the free quote option. There's how many, you see how much money it costs. Suddenly a ton of people drop off, right? That's how to do conversion optimization. Where's the friction? How can you buff out the rough spots in your website? This shows you where they are. Without that, it's just total guesswork. This is, I don't have the guts to do this. Kind of a side note. I'm, I'm in a lot of meetings where people say, I like green. No, I like blue. What's better, green or blue? People just ask like these sort of subjective questions that make it very difficult to take action, like based on opinion. I try to, hopefully, I haven't said one opinion yet. Hopefully I never said opinion. I shouldn't have any opinions. It's, we're past, we're, it's a post-subjective world. It's unnecessary to have opinions. I'm, if I was courageous enough, in, I would put on my conference tables, we have two big conference rooms, and I would love to, and it would be fun to do this. I'd feel like a jerk if I did this with clients. But put a whistle and a bell on the conference room table. Anytime anyone makes it a suggestion that's based on opinion, blow the whistle. <laughs> Anytime someone makes this, you know, is looking for data you know, based on analytics, ring the bell. Create a culture on your team of people make it, being skeptical, being curious, challenging themselves, looking for insights, and rarely, right, without serious qualification, would they ever give a, an opinion. It's risky. It worries me when I'm in meetings and people say, I like pop-ups or I don't like pop-ups. You're a data set of one. Why would you trust your own opinion? That's not marketing. That's guesswork. That's personal preference. There's not much room for personal preference in this, in this world. Those people do, I don't know, branding or some other industry. Nothing against branding. Branding's good, right? There's a place for branding. I like, I like, and I like beauty, too. I'm not anti-beauty. and that's, beauty, Beauty's good. My designers hate it when I talk like this. Like, you know, the client has to approve this, Andy. You know, you gotta make him like it. Okay. So anyway, yeah, these are, side rant is over. 
these are uh, ways to reduce your drop off in a, in a multi step conversion. So I'm going to combine a bunch of these things into uh, uh, a single question. Which pages get the most traffic from social media? So here's my all pages report. I can't see wh what, which of these pages get the most traffic from social media, which is a really useful question actually. Which pages get the most traffic from social media? Here's all my pages. Now I want to add social media traffic to this, so I need to add, I'm going to add a secondary dimension. What secondary dimension will tell me that? Medium. Medium is the broader source of, broader origin for traffic. Medium might be email or organic or social or direct. So I'm going to put in medium. Whoa, it's all organic, organic, organic. Where's my social media traffic? I need a filter for my secondary dimension. But that's not the first column, so I need to use an advanced filter. So I click to set an advanced filter, and I set the medium to contain social. Click apply. Voila. These are the pages that get the most traffic from social media. I combined a, just looked at the all pages report, added a secondary dimension, and an advanced filter to be able to filter for that second column, showing me just social. There's the list. These pages get the most traffic from social media. Another way to do that is to find it with a segment. We haven't touched on it yet, but up here at the top, all users, this is everybody. Unless you put, click on that, you're always looking at everybody. There's definitely another way to add to, to find just the social media visitors. So what I did a second ago was I was playing with this report, and when I play with this report, it only affects this stuff down here. If I leave this report and go somewhere else and come back, it's all reset. But if I create a segment, that segment is at the top. It stays with me for every report that I navigate through. Segments will persist throughout your visit and analytics. It, secondary dimensions and filters only stay as long as you're on that one report. So if I add a segment, and, I, and you can just, I think I, I might have made this. You can make one. The system has some default ones. If social isn't in there, you can create one. It's not hard. But I'm just going to choose social. I don't know if this is a default one, but I have one called social, which is just people who come from social media. Um, so I just, that's how I found it. I searched for it and chose that. These are segments. And then click apply. And there they are. I'm seeing all the visitors and just the social media visitors. All the visitors and social media visitors. See, there's a second trend line now, the orange one. Social is orange. This site, only 3% of visitors are from social media. So if I just remove or drag down, it just drops it off, or just click on remove for the first one. Now I'm just looking at social media visitors. Here's the same report. Which pages get the most traffic from social media? I did it once using a secondary dimension and filter. This time I did it with a segment. If you do it with a segment, now I can click all over the all over analytics and find anything, find conversions for just that audience, or find whoever. I have a friend, uh, Charles Farina, who is a speaker at our, our conference. And he, uh, he calls segments audiences. And the better way to think about it. You just make different audiences. One of the ways you can make these is by conditions. I want to see just people who visited the blog. I want to see just people who converted. You can make the conditional ones, people who just touched this section of the website. Um, if we have time, we can do some of those together. So yeah, now I'm still looking at social. and I'm clicking around. Now I'm looking at just mobile visitors, desktop, mobile, and, and tablet. These are just social media mobile visitors. Suddenly, wow, way more of my visitors are on social media than before. Not surprising. Anyone who's active in email or social media has a greater percentage of visitors from, from mobile. So now, if you found a report that was useful to you, anytime, this is a condition I, I've trained myself, anytime I find some insight, I click on that button, save. Anytime you find insights, right? Because like that secondary dimension, kind of hard to make a secondary dimension and that fancy advanced filter and the regular expression for five plus word phrases. Like, wow, this is so complicated. I'm never going to remember how I did this. You don't have to remember how you did it. Just click on Save, and now that report will show up in a saved report. Anything, any filter, any segments, it doesn't save the date range, but it saves every configuration you made to that report. Just give it a name, like this one, long tail key phrases. And now it appears up here in the customization section for saved reports. It's called long tail key phrases. Remember to say to anything that you find that any aha moments, any light bulbs, just go straight for that thing and save it. 
because it's kind of hard to remember. Like, how do I got, like, I'm never going to find this one again. Like, where was, where am I? You know. So that's uh, that's very handy. And then we get into like the collaboration, right? Sharing reports. Anybody here that has a client or works as part of a team, which it should be all of us, will find greater value from analytics if you learn ways to work with other people on it together. So don't go it alone. So this report, I'm looking at long tail key phrases. Now maybe I want to share this with someone else. I can just click on share. Or these are people who have those like annoying boss who keeps asking you for reports and you kind of, you know, you're like, oh, I got to, you know, I know what Andy would say, reports are, it's a data puke, there's no value there, it's not, anal you know, it's not analysis. But if someone really does just want reports, if you're just trying to report to someone, you just want a bunch of data, yeah, just click on share and then have it just choose, okay, fine, I'll send you your report. You're going to get it every Monday as a PDF. SEO partner, helper, here's the, here's the weekly report. Set it and forget it, I'm done, I'm out. Like you can, there's your weekly report. <laughs> I'm not going to generate that report for you every week. Stop asking me to do something. I, I built a robot to do that job for you, okay? So there's your weekly report. You don't have, it, it shouldn't, we shouldn't be spending time generating reports. So the whole idea is to take this information and do it for, take action. Share it, make decisions, and take action. So we're not going to just smile and frown. We're going to turn we're, ideas into questions. We're going to share insights, make decisions, and take action, and then measure the impact. One of the ways that we can do that and become a lot more effective is to add annotations. I look at clients' accounts all the time, and I see something like this. Boom. Wow, that's awesome. What happened? Oh, I think it was that newspaper wrote about us. I can't remember. Let me go back and look. Or maybe it was a newsletter. I think we sent a newsletter that day. Or we uh, were experimenting under an ad. We bought an ad somewhere. Or, or whoa, what happened? Oh, that um, we were launching a new site, and the code wasn't there yet, and it wasn't working. These are problems, because that person's not going to be there forever. How do I know what really happened? How am I going to find out later? So what we can do in analytics is create an annotation that shows what happened on that date. I think this is a tiny video. Yeah, so we're going to click on that tiny arrow to pull this down. It's like a drawer. Here, watch this. That was March 27th. So I'm going to go click on this little drawer. I'm going to click on Create New Annotation. And I'm going to type, I'm going to go to March 27th or whenever that was. And I'm going to, I'm going to type into this box like, I'm literally typing something awesome happened. <laughs> and it's going to save that as a note that will appear. See that, see that little dot? That's going to stay there. I can choose to share it with my team, right? I can put a star on it if I want to, like if it was a major event, like a website change. So these are ways, so anytime something happens now, like, wow, what was that? Oh, I just click on the little dot, little word bubble, and I can look back and see that was when nine things, blah, 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 like some article we published. Look at my mini naming convention, newsletter, 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 newsletter. Create a naming convention so that you can scan through and see them all at a glance, because there's going to be like 6,500 of these eventually. Choose a long date range, it's going to be filled with tiny dots under there. It's going to be very hard to scan through and know what they all mean. So I recommend that you create naming conventions for things like newsletter, name of email campaign, or advertising, stop, started, paused, press hit, website change, launch that new section, change URL structure, analytics change. So we start that with analytics change. Wow, ever since Andy got hired, we lost 20% of our traffic. That guy stinks. Oh wait, what's this? Click. Oh no, he filtered out traffic from our office. Oh no, he excluded traffic from known bots and spiders. If you go set up that filter now and you lose one third of your traffic and people start freaking out in your office, you have to explain that to them. So make sure to be efficient by going and making a note for that now saying analytics change colon excluded traffic from our office's IP address. And then no one's going to look back one day and say that you are bad at marketing because you made your analytics more accurate. You get the idea. So yeah, these are all things that should be tracked in analytics as tiny annotations. They affect nothing. But our job is partly here to tell stories with the data. They're helping us tell stories with the data. I'm a huge advocate of this tool. Um, this is not an ideal way to report something or to influence someone or to get approval for something or to uh, make a difference on my team. If I just write this sentence, six years ago we had no mobile traffic. Now 60% of our traffic is mobile. You might be impressed. You might not be. It sounded OK. You had to read it. But look at this. Wow, mobile traffic went from zero to 60 in six years. I can see it right there. Look, there's a segment. 
wow, look, it was almost nothing, and now it's like more than half of our traffic. Those arrows <laughs> are definitely more persuasive than my line of text. This is true, it looks like a law in digital marketing. Text is weaker than images, and images are weaker than video. <coughs> take a page on your site. That's why I said take your best blog post and make it a video. Anything that you've published in any format anywhere, whether it's internally for your team or just in your marketing in general, look to always upgrade the format on your top pages. Turn that text into an image like I did here. But bottom line, my suggestion in general is to, uh, I, I, I ranted against opinion. This is, I'm a child of the 80s. I'm a Gen X guy, I already told you. This, is take, this picture was taken just a few blocks from here. What movie is that? What movie? Untouchables. Untouchables. John Connery's famous line, never bring a knife to a gunfight. Never bring an opinion to a data fight. Be very careful. You're in these meetings and people have personal preference and they're telling you all about what they like, what they think, what they want. See you, Diddy. But that's risky, right? What we, opinion, have you heard the term hippo? The highest paid person's opinion? Yeah, this is, this is a problem. Opinion versus opinion, the highest paid person's opinion wins. Happens all the time. Opinion versus data, the data will win. Data versus data, the best data wins. That's digital marketing, right? You get the idea. So I'm gonna slow down on this topic here at the end. I think we're getting down, getting down to it. Uh, the best things in life aren't in analytics. I wish I could track the handwritten thank you notes I get. That to me is important. It's not there. Karma, also not a real report in analytics. Kind of a joke slide, but I think it's like there's more to life than the data itself. The fun report, every time I collaborate or Hope invites me to something, you know, the fun starts to spike. Also not a real report in analytics. I know people like get too into it, so I show these slides like it's, it's not everything, right? There's more than that. Um, here's a bunch of slides from the press. Here's uh, this video. This, we're on slide bazillion something now, but here at the end you can find this, these videos on how to set up analytics, how to use Google Tag Manager, how to set up uh, campaign tracking. That's the book, which is, we're about to launch the fifth edition. That's the Google Analytics Academy. If anyone's in transition looking for a new job or trying to grow their career in this direction, go take the GAIQ test. Just sounds smart, doesn't it? GAIQ test. Google Analytics individual qualification. You go watch a bunch of videos that Google made, then you go take this test, it costs 50 bucks. If you pass the test, they give you like this PDF that you can put on your fridge. It says Google Analytics individual qualification. It lasts for two years. Put that on your LinkedIn profile. It's instant credibility. Trust me, no one else who's also applying for that job or trying to get that client has that. Very few people do. And mostly you don't learn to do analysis, you learn how it works. You learn how to set it up. But it's still quite useful. That's our blog, there's Avinash's blog, Annie Lytix, Annie Cushing, Enor. Uh, I recommend that book. Look how smart he is. That's my son, Eli. He's, uh, I told you, he's dual threat marketer. Very good at SEO and CRO. He's a conversion search dual threat marketer. Actually, he tried to eat this book in the next, uh, in the next slide. Um, I know people who, none of you guys obviously because you're here, but I know people who think that it's someone else's job. Oh, I need to find someone to do my analytics for me. The psychology around Google Analytics is that of abdication. Most people want to feel like someone's going doing something for it. They can pay someone a bunch of money to make reports, then they feel like something's being done, right? They feel like it's someone else's job and that they can get someone else to do it and they don't have to worry about it because it's being done. It's like saying, you know, we're all going to play baseball and we're all baseball players and that baseball player is in charge of the scoreboard. Super weird. Every player is in charge of the scoreboard. Who needs it? It's like driving a car. Did anyone drive here? I said this earlier. How often do you look at your dashboard? Would you ever outsource your dashboard? I don't have time to look at my dashboard. I'm too busy driving. I can't do the dashboard. I'm the driver. I need someone else to do the dashboard. Can you please watch my dashboard for me? That would be crazy. Because the person who's using, the person who's doing the marketing needs to be able to see the outcome. Thank you. This was fun. <laughs>